Greetings, I'm Malik Israel. I started this podcast in order to share my unique views on this thing we call life and everything in it. And yes, I have the audacity to speak the truth. So brace yourself, because I'm known for being brutally honest. Welcome to the Audacity of Truth podcast with our host, Malik Israel. This is a very special episode of The Audacity of Truth. I will take that audacity and use it to eliminate all myths that I have time for concerning the Bible. The Holy Bible has been widely mistaught and widely misunderstood. And today, you are going to get the nitty-gritty concerning everything that I can think of that I have time for within this short time span to cover concerning the Bible. I want to start this at the beginning. The Bible says... In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. So you can notice right here, God created the heaven and the earth. This is the God of the Bible. God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. So when God created the heaven and the earth, it was without form. So it was created in God's consciousness. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. You can't see anything in the darkness. So therefore, it was nothing to see as far as the heaven and the earth was concerned. So it was all all part of God's consciousness, all part of God's imagination in the beginning. And the Spirit of God, okay, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This is God's Spirit, not God doing any work himself. It was the Spirit of God that moved. God just calls the shots. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening. And the morning were the first day. So it takes the evening and a morning to make a day. Not in reverse like the Gentiles say. The morning and the evening. No, that's that's backwards. See, the Gentile has a habit of putting everything in reverse. Doing everything backwards. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. So there's a firmament. When you look above, the first thing that you're going to see is water. The thing that you're going to see after that is the firmament. And on the other side of the firmament is more water. We'll get into more specifics on that shortly. Verse 7, And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So this is heaven. The firmament is heaven. So is this where all of your loved ones, your good old grandma, and everybody that died a long time ago, is this where they went? To the firmament, right? Let's let's show you what's in the firmament. Let's Let's see if we find any people in the firmament. Continue verse 8, and then it says, And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven... Be gathered together. So under the heaven is under the firmament. So the waters under the heaven is to be gathered together into one place. And let the dry land appear. And it was so. So the waters under the firmament or under the heaven was gathered together in one place. And the dry land appeared. Verse 10, and God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seed, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven 
to divide day from the night. So now God put lights in the firmament of the heaven. Remember, this is heaven. The firmament is heaven. Okay, so we, we don't see no people there yet or no souls or no spirits or nothing else there. We see light. God, let there be lights in the firmament to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So these lights in the firmament are for signs. So you can, you know, what do a sign do? A sign leads you in a particular direction. It more or less gives instructions. On well, this is this, that is that, don't do this and don't do that, right? So now these signs that God put in the lights of the heavens, what signs are, you, are they talking about? They have to be talking about astrological signs, which give you instructions about a lot of different things. Also about seasons and days and years. But it also the, these signs in the, in the firmament of heaven tell you about the people that operate under these signs. You know, astrological signs. Anyway, verse 15. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The great light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. So we don't see nothing but lights in the firmament. Not people, not souls, not spirits, not none of that. All these lights. You can, you can still look up and see these lights today, to this day. Every morning, you see the greater light. Every night, you see the lesser light. Anyway, verse 17 again. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So the birds go to heaven every time they try to fly. Is this where you say your, your great-grandmama is? And your mama? And all your loved ones, your brothers and your sisters and everybody that you said that died and went to heaven? Is this where they are? I see this is where the birds is flying at. I see the lights and the birds in this heaven. I haven't seen no souls and no people yet. But let's keep reading. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. So all of these things that God brought forth, everything that moveth upon the face of the waters and so forth, he brought forth abundantly after their kind. And he blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man. Oh, wait a minute. Right here, verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man. Now he's talking about adding some other maker, not a creator, because he said, Let us make man. Now he's bringing in another maker. And then he said, Let us make man in our image. He's talking to something that has an image. As we know, God is a spirit. I can show you all over the Bible that God only showed up in and clouds and fire and things like that that don't really have an image. It's just part of spirit. It's some, just something that, you know, you don't, you don't, it has no substance to it. It has no substance to it. It's just there when it's there. And then when it ceased to exist, it's just not there no more. Either way, God said, let us make man in our image. So now, the image that God is referring to here, our this image is all in his heart. It's all in his consciousness. It's all in his mind, right? So collectively, they have an image, right? Okay, now, an image imagined 
in God's consciousness. Just like the earth was void and without form, it was imagined in God's consciousness, this image. All right, so now, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, so now God made man after our image. Hmm. When I say our like that, I think about me and some other ones that look like me. So God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. You know, this in itself, it, it tells you something about man, because God gave them dominion over everything. So now, when you think about man, you have to realize that God has dominion. I'm sorry, that man has dominion over everything on the earth, over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth. This is what man has dominion over. So this identifies man. So now, in order for you to determine if you are man or not, man is the species, male and female, if you are man or not, you have to exhibit some dominion over everything. And I ask you, so-called black man and black woman, what do you have total dominion over? I can answer that for you. Nothing. So that tells me that you must not be man. But nevertheless, you want to call yourself man and woman. All of that must be a misnomer. Because God said you had dominion over everything if you was man. I can point out who has dominion over everything on this earth. And that is the Caucasian. That is the so-called white man. They have dominion over everything. So therefore, they are man. I'm going to see if I can help you discover who you are, so-called black man. You know, when you look at a zebra, a zebra has all the attributes of a horse. But it's called a zebra because it looks, it's black and white. Horses be all kind of different colors, right? But nevertheless, the zebra is different than a horse because it's named something different. God named it because the name of something is its nature. The zebra has a different nature than a horse. That's the difference. Now you look at your nature, black man and black woman. Tell me about your nature. Is it different than the Caucasians? It should be, even though you're trying to make it the same. If you examine it closely, you'll find out that it's different. Anyway, I'm about to give away the secret, but let's keep it moving. Let me read that again. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So now, this is telling you that male and female is man. Man is a species. This is saying that God created man in his own image. So this image that was created was created in God's consciousness. But God called in us to make this man in our image. Do y'all see that? If you don't, read that scripture over and over again until you get it. Moving on. Verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. Who is the them that God is talking to? He's talking to man. He's telling man. So this is the first commandment given to man. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Now, why is man replenishing the earth? Because man was not the first thing created. The, let me put it a different way. The creation of man was not the first creation. In a previous creation, God created dinosaurs and all of that type of thing. That's why we don't see them. That's why we, all we find is their bones and remains. We've never seen one walking on the earth, even though they're probably working on trying to clone some dinosaurs, so maybe someday in the future we'll see something like that walking the earth. But right now, we don't have it. But anyway, verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So this man has dominion over every living thing. You know, like in person, place, or thing. So if it's a person, a place, or a thing, then it's either of them or all of them. I don't know. Contemplate that for a while. See if you can figure that one out. Anyway, verse 29. And God said, Behold, 
I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, of all the earth, and every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. So God is telling you where you're supposed to get your meat from right here. He's telling this man where to get, you, where to get his meat from. God is telling you this. So now, how can you call yourself God if you're not following the real God's instructions? If I want to be a millionaire, I'm going to go to a millionaire and ask him, how do I become a millionaire? Once he gives me some instructions, I'm going to follow those instructions if I want to become a millionaire. So here God is giving you instructions on how to become God. He's telling you what you need to eat. Later on in the Bible, he's going to tell you what you need to do. All of these things are written by the prophets of God, written by the prophets of the God of the Bible. Either way, let's continue. And God saw everything that he made, that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So now, only thing that we've seen different so far is that everywhere else before we got to verse 26, it said, and God made, and God said, and God said, and God called, and, and all of this type of stuff. But when it got to verse 26, it says, and God said, let us make man. All the other ones, when it says, God said, let the earth bring forth, and God created, and God said, let the waters bring forth, and all this type of stuff. So he just commanded it to, br uh, to be brought forth, and it was. Well, when it comes to man, God said, let us make man. We're going to find out in a minute why that's different, okay? Because us made man, not God. God created man in his consciousness. He saw the image of what man was to be in his consciousness, but us made man. So thus far, I've killed several myths that people have convinced you is the truth. I've killed the myth about your grandmama and your grandfather uh, and your loved ones being in heaven because every place that we read concerning heaven, we didn't see any body's loved ones or any good people in heaven. Only thing we saw was lights and signs and the fire flying, birds flying in heaven. We didn't see no people. We didn't see no souls. We didn't see no spirits. We didn't see none of that stuff, right? Then we killed the myth about who man is, which we got some more to deal with that on that because you don't even call yourself man. You call yourself human. So we're going to find out what human is. Anyway, so far we've killed the myth about uh, people being God. God is the creator. If you're going to be like God or in the family of God, then you have to follow the instructions of God. The blueprint has been set out for you in the Bible. These are the instructions that you have to follow if, if you want to be in the family of God. Everybody want to run around talking about everybody is a child of God. That's the biggest lie I've ever been told. Most people are, have nothing to do with God. God don't even recognize you. I'm going to show you that also. Okay, we're going we're gonna to keep it moving. Check it out. This is Genesis chapter 2. Verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth. And the heavens. So you see that God is finished with the earth and the heavens. Right? He, he let us make man. He said let there be light. He put lights in the firmament. He told you that the, the, the fire was flying in the firmament of the heaven. So forth and so on. So all of God's work as it concerns earth is finished. Then it goes on to say. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. When they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth. So all of this stuff was made before it was in the earth. In God's consciousness, all of this stuff was made. Then God sent out his spirit to actually do the work. God's work 
was the creation, was the conscious part of everything. Everything else, God sent his servants to do. I'm a servant of God. That's why I'm telling you the truth about the Bible today. It's for your own best interest. It's for your own good. It can save your life. It can save your condition. It can save your finances. It can, the word of God can save everything about you. But nevertheless, you want to run around talking about you saved and you don't know nothing about God. Well, we're going to see if we can change that. Because all you've been hearing about your whole life is a devil. And I'm going to show you that. Whoever you've been worshiping is a devil. And I'm going to show you that in the Bible. All right? Let's continue. Verse 5. We're going to read that again. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was not a man to till the ground. So it hadn't rained, and there was no man to till the ground. So man had to be made before all of these things could be in the earth. Because man job is to till the ground. That sounds like a servant to me. That sounds like a worker, you know, like uh, the working class that Kamala Harris talks about. She talks about the middle class and the working class. So if you're in the working class, that means you're in the slave class. You're in the lowest class. If you work every day, you're in the working class. According to Kamala Harris, that's the lower class, right? She talks about the middle class. The middle class must be the non-working class. This must be the class that owns businesses. The middle class is the ones that own business. The upper class is the 1%. We'll get into that a little later, though. But there went up a mist, verse 6, But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So before, now let's take, let's take this in order. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So God formed this man of the dust of the ground, but he used us to do it. He didn't do it himself. He told you already, he, used, he, he said, let us make man in our image. So us made man, he formed him from the dust of the ground, and, and had his spirit breathe into man's nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So before man became a living soul, he was just an uh, inactive soul or a dead soul, you might want to say. Just laying there, right? And God had his spirit breathe into man's nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul, right? But man is, is dirt. It don't get no lower than dirt. But so far, the heavens and the earth is finished. I haven't seen where God made any human. I'm looking here, and I have, I've looked at this several times. I read this Bible from cover to cover several times. Never seen the word human in here. The, the word human is not in the Bible. So God did not make humans. I hope that's clear. I'm going to show you what the human is a little later. We're going to keep going. Again, and God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of the land is good. There is billium and onyx stone. God is starting to talk about where all of the, the precious minerals are in the earth, right? But I'm going to show you what God said in order for you to take part in the riches of the earth. In order to obtain all of these riches, that's more important than showing you where they are because just showing you where, where they are. You might do what man decided to do and go and steal them from, from these particular lands, from the people who have been put there as guardianship over these precious minerals. Man just decided he's going to take some guns and some machinery or whatever the case may be and technology and go and take this stuff from the people who was given to by God. And I'm going to show you what God said about how to obtain all of this stuff. I'm trying to tell you that what I'm telling you, this truth that I'm telling you, is for your own good. 
is supposed to save you from yourself, from your lower self. Check it out. Go on to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, where it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So all of these things that God is talking about in the previous chapter, he's telling man by man, because in your Bible it's probably written in red as if Jesus is saying this. And it could be the man Jesus saying this. But it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So this is telling you, if Jesus is saying this, this is telling you that God is something other than him. Because he said, he didn't say my righteousness. He didn't say, seek ye first the kingdom of my kingdom. He said, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not my righteousness. And these things shall be added unto you. So you're supposed to seek God's face, seek the kingdom of God and all of those precious minerals, gold and silver and onyx stone and all of that type of stuff will be added unto you. But most people want to circumvent God and go straight to the stuff. That's why it brings you pain and misery and suffering because you did not follow the protocol. You followed the instructions of a devil telling you to go and get the stuff on your own and circumvent God. Anyway, let's go a little further. Back to Genesis chapter 2. Uh, we'll pick it up at verse 15 where it says, And God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So man's job in the garden was to dress it and to keep it. He's a gardener, right? He's a lower, lower class. This is what man was created for, to do all the slave type work, right? So now. It says, verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So God told the man, Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because of the very first day that you eat of it, that's the day you're going to die. Now we know that man ate of this tree. But the myth has it that it was an apple tree. All right, we're going to bust that myth right, right now. We're going to bust that right now. Verse 18, And the Lord said, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And God gave names to all cattle and to all the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, hold on, let me, let me stop it right there. This is, a, this is a myth that's been taught to people that God opened up man's flesh a male, that is, right? Adam. The definition of Adam is in different books that I'm sure you're going to be surprised to find out who Adam is. And this is going to prove who man is, right? I'm going to, I'm going to show you all of this stuff today before this lesson is over with, before this podcast is over with. Anyway, it says that God took one of, God, uh, one of Adam's ribs and closed up the flesh. That sounds like a surgery to me, right? You know God is not doing none of this work. God's spirit is doing this work. God's spirit operates through sentient beings such as myself. God's spirit is operating through me right now. Anyway, he closed up the, the flesh thereof after the surgery, after he took one of the ribs from Adam. Okay, what did he do with that rib? I can tell you. The book don't tell you, but I can tell you. He took that rib and he took the DNA of it just like they're doing today, they're opening up living beings and taking their parts and they're using those parts to clone things that's similar to the thing that the DNA was taken from. They're cloning all types of stuff. They got movies about it nowadays, which I intended to deal with at a later date. But one of the movies that comes to mind is the one about Jamie Foxx. It's not about Jamie Foxx. The name of it is they clone 
Tyrone, but Jamie Foxx is in it. Shortly after that movie, Jamie Foxx come up missing, believed to be dead and cloned. But we'll deal with that a little later. Anyway, this is what God had his spirit do. Take the flesh of Adam, use its DNA, and create a woman. Because you know it's contrary to nature for a man to give birth to anything. People running around with this ridiculous thought talking about man gave birth to a woman. That's the biggest lie ever been told. Man ain't never gave birth. You got fags and sissies running around today trying to give birth to babies. They can't do it. They're trying all types of stuff. Hormones and all types. They don't have a womb. The womb is not natural. If they take a womb out of a woman, then it's the woman that gave birth to the child. The woman's womb that gave birth to the child, not the man. You understand what I'm saying? Think about what I'm telling you. It don't make sense for a man to give birth to anything because that's not natural. It's not the natural course of things. Anyway, let's continue. Verse 22. And the rib which God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, which it was because she was cloned, and flesh of my flesh, which she was, because she was cloned, and she shall be called woman. In other words, a man with a womb, because she was taken out of man. It would be better said that she was created from man. Therefore, verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and there shall be one flesh. Because there was one flesh from the beginning. That's simple. Verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. You know, you see people running around naked all the time nowadays. They ain't ashamed. You got these whores out here showing all the ass. They're not ashamed. They're proud of it. Where did that come from? Anyway, let's continue. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. This is verse 3. I'm, I'm sorry. This is chapter 3, verse 1. And now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it. So now, remember, when God gave the commandment not to eat of that tree, the woman wasn't even there yet. The woman wasn't in the garden then. This was before the woman. But the woman is doing all of the speaking. She's basically spreading some hearsay. She heard Adam say that God said that, but God did not command her. God commanded the male, the man. Now, apparently, the man passed that information on to the woman, and she agreed, apparently. So now she's confronting the serpent. The serpent started off talking to her. Why didn't you go find, why didn't the serpent go find Adam? That's because a serpent can more easily influence a woman than he can a man. That's why. Verse 4, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Let me go back to verse 3 first to get the whole synopsis. Verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Not only you can't eat this fruit, but you weren't even supposed to touch it. That's the same thing with everything that God told you not to eat. You ain't even supposed to touch it. Anyway, let's continue. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Then this woman was probably, wow, I'm going to be a god if I eat the knowledge of this tree. And that sounds pretty good. I like to be God. This is what all devils want to be. They want to be God. You can never be as great as your creator. Your creator will always be greater. There's no way around that. How can a chair that I created be greater than the one that created it. That's me. How can that chair be greater than me and I created the chair? That's ridiculous. You can't even be the same. 
because that chair is not going to be to create anything. It can only make things. And I'll explain that to you later. Either way. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Okay, now. The woman saw that the tree was good for food. Okay. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. It was attractive. And the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. I haven't seen the word apple here yet. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So the woman gave the fruit from that tree to her husband, which uh, based on what I'm reading here, I don't see the husband here anywhere. I don't see Adam here anywhere. Adam was probably tilling the ground somewhere, and she's over philandering with a devil. Because that's what it is. It's not a serpent. It's a devil that she's speaking to. Matter of fact, it's one of us. One of the ones that made man. Remember that part? In Genesis, in the first chapter of Genesis, this is us, a one of us, that is speaking to this woman, having the spirit of a devil on him, telling her contrary to what God has told her. That's what devils do. They tell you contrary to what God has said. Either way, verse 7, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. All of a sudden, they knew they, that they was naked. All of a sudden, they was ashamed, because apparently, the serpent had told them all types of things to convince them to do contrary to, what's, to what God had instructed the man to do. But don't forget, he brought this nonsense to the woman. And then the woman took it to the man. The instructions from God, the man took that to the woman, and the woman defiled that because of her lust, because of her lust to be God. And that woman, she'll try to rule over you, man, if you allow her. A real man is not going to be ruled over by no woman. Or once I show you who you are, if you are of another genetic makeup than a man, I'm going to try to show that to you also. Either way, verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. So now Adam knew that he had sinned against God. Therefore, he was without the protection of God. That's why he was afraid. Adam knew that he had ruined the protection that he was entitled to all the time that he was obeying the commandments of God. You are entitled to protection when you obey the commandments of God. When you have no protection in this world, you are susceptible. If you have no protection from God in this world, you are susceptible to everything that could possibly come your way. It's a million plus ways to die. You are susceptible to all of them for disobeying the commandments of God. This is why I keep trying to convince you to accept the truth about God. God gave commandments for man to obey, not to forsake. When you forsake God, God forsakes you. This is what Adam was afraid of. He also knew that death was the penalty for sin. Let me show you that also. Going to Romans chapter 5 verse 12 where it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. This is the admonishment of God through man, where man is telling man, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. This one man was Adam. By one man, sin entered into the world. Before that, there was no sin. There was no death. Man was created to live forever. But the saying holds true that the day that man sins, that day man shall surely die. Let me show you that also. I'm going to read one verse from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So in other words, to God, a day is like a thousand years. A day is a thousand years to God. So that means that man will not live to be 
beyond a thousand years old. You can't find one character written of in the Bible, including Methuselah, who lived to be over a thousand years old. Methuselah lived to be 900 and something years old. Nobody lived beyond 900 and something. That's that one day to God because of sin, because of the first man's sin. The first man's sin was God, was Adam, sinned against God that brought death into the world. So everybody that you see in the casket at the funeral home died because of sin, not because of Adam's sin, but because of their own sin. Even though God gave you grace, gave you a pass, let you live beyond the point which you committed the sin, you still won't live forever like you was created to be, like you was intended to live, you will die within one day. Most of us die a lot sooner than one day. We don't even make it to be a half a day old. We don't even make it to be a quarter of a day old. Most of us don't even make it to be a tenth of a day old. A tenth would be a hundred years. Nowadays, depending on your nationality and where you live at, you may not even make it to be 30 years old. And it's all because of sin. When Jesus died on the cross or however he died, it was because of sin. Not somebody else's sin, his own. Because he was allowing people to worship him and to honor him and do all of the things toward him that they were supposed to have been doing to the creator, to the father, to God. Jesus had opportunity, which I've shown you, to say that he was God. He never said that he was God, but he allowed everybody else to say or treat him as if he was God. He was running around calling himself the son of God because as far as he could tell, he was obeying the commandments of God. That's why he was considered the son of God. God had many sons, many sons. Jesus was not the son of God. Listen, people, I'm telling y'all this for your own good so you can get it straight in your heart so you can start to walk according to the will of God and seek God's face. No man has never seen God. Let me show you that. I'm going to read one verse from John 1, verse 18. This is man, according to the Spirit of God, speaking to man. As it says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So this is even saying the one that they call Jesus, who, who everybody talking about is in the bosom of God, the only begotten Son, has declared God has declared the Father. You haven't seen him, so this holds true. No man has seen God at any time. So all of these ones talking about they seen Jesus, Jesus ain't God first, fool. You're a fool if you think that Jesus is God. You've been made a fool of, and I got the audacity to tell you the truth. Let me show you how big a fool these false prophets have made of you. I'm going to show you who Jesus is, but before we get to that, let's go back so I can show you who this human is, because like I said, I haven't seen human in the Bible. So we need to figure out who this human is that you people keep calling yourselves. Like I said, God did not create humans because human is not in the Bible. So in search of the word human, I went to the Ballantine's Law Dictionary, the 1930 edition. And then I went to AI and I asked AI to find the definition of human being in the 1930 Ballantine's Law Dictionary. And this is the result that I got from AI. It said, based on the search results provided, the 1930 Ballantine's Law Dictionary definition of human being is quite unusual and controversial. Here's what we can determine. The 1930 Ballantine's Law Dictionary defines human being as follows. C. Monster. That's what it says in the actual book. It says, when you look up the word human being, it says sea monster. When looking up the definition of monster in the same dictionary, it says a human being by birth, but in some part resembling a lower animal. So that's about all that AI would provide as far as the definition of human being is concerned. So I went back to the Ballantine's Law Dictionary to complete the definition, and this is what it says. Monster, a human being by birth, but in some part resembling a lower animal. A monster has no inheritable blood and cannot be heir to any land. The source, again, is 
Valentine's Law Dictionary, 1930 edition, page 830. You know, every time I think of the word monster, I think about the movie that I saw a long time ago called Frankenstein. Frankenstein is still available on some networks. But anyway, in Frankenstein, the whole thing of the movie was is that this guy named Frank and the other guy was named Stein and these two guys got together and they created a monster through genetic engineering and or cloning. And they called the monster Frankenstein. So that's what I think of also about this word monster. I think about something that has been cloned because it didn't get here naturally. It's a combination of things that was not created by God. So therefore, it's a monster. This is why the law dictionary defines human being as being a monster. So now, do you still want to consider yourself to be a human being? That's your free will to consider yourself to be whatever you want it to be. But this is why you get treated the way that you get treated by the authorities is because they know what a human being is. And if you claim to be one, then you're entitled to treatment as if you were a monster. Consider that. People, I'm telling you all this stuff so that you can get on the right track. You can quit worshiping devils. Quit running around calling yourself a monster. Quit being a murderer, a sinner, and a swine flesh eater. Let me show you some of what the dietary law of God has to say about what you're supposed to eat. Now remember, God told Adam, don't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. Later he said, don't even touch it. And this is what you're supposed to do about your food. God told you not to eat swine. Matter of fact, if he tell you not to eat something, it's poison to you. People don't understand how it's poison to you because they don't realize the, the effect. Swine poisons the consciousness. It poisons your connection to the universe. You cannot get a download from the ethers directly into your consciousness because of that swine. So therefore, you become spiritually dead. This is what I need you to understand. Now, I know part of Christianity allows you to do all this type of stuff. That's because Christianity is of devils. Because I can show you the definition of a Gentile. Let me show you the definition of Gentile also. Book source, Webster's Dictionary, Collegiate Edition. Gentile, often cap, of or relating to the nations at large as distinguished from the Jews. Also, of or relating to Christians as distinguished from the Jew. So this is saying that a Gentile and a Christian is the same thing. Number two definition of Gentile is heathen, comma, pagan. It's saying that the synonyms for Gentile is a heathen, and a pagan, right? So now let's go find out what heathen means. So therefore we can find out what a Gentile means and a Christian because Christian and Gentile is the same thing. So let's look up heathen. Heathen as defined in the Webster's Dictionary also. Heathen, an unconverted member of a people or nation that does not acknowledge the God of the Bible. So heathen means a people who have not been converted, that are of a nation or a people that does not acknowledge the God of the Bible. So heathen and pagan is the synonyms for the word Christian and Gentile. So a Christian is a heathen and a heathen is a Gentile. And Christians, according to the definition, I didn't write this. I'm just reading it for you. I'm expressing this truth. I have the audacity to tell the truth to you. Although most people hate truth because they've been told lies most of their lives, but I'm trying to help you save your life, man, and stop worshiping these devils because you've been taught by false prophets who you support, which you refuse to support me for telling you the truth. You support a, a false prophet all day because he lied to you. He tell you what you want to hear. He tell you you can do anything and, and be anything and be a homosexual and be all the things that God hates and still be loved by God. That's the, that is the biggest lie. That's not one of the biggest lies. That's the biggest lie ever been told. God still hates what he hates, and I'm seeking the mind of God, so I hate the same things. 
But anyway, I'm going to tell you about yourself so you can help correct yourself. And, you know, don't be dismayed because Christianity has proven itself to be a false religion, serving a false god, serving devils. Don't be dismayed by that. Just change. Just quit doing wrong in the, in the sight of God so you can get some angels on your side to help protect you. Right now, you're naked, just like Adam and Eve was in the garden. If you make a vow to repent from your wicked ways, your wicked ways of sinning and serving false gods, and you notify me, I'll do everything I can to help you see the truth and help you correct your ways and help you to get the blessings of the God of the Bible. All you have to do is quit serving devil. Now, let's go look up the word pagan. Pagan was another one of those words that meant the same thing as Gentile, right? Let's look that up. Hold on. You might be thinking, well, you know, I've been taught this all my, I've been a Christian of my whole life. Now he's showing me all this, all this type of stuff. I don't know what to believe. Okay, believe whatever you want to believe. But know this, that you can't cry innocence. When you get judged out here in these streets or wherever you are, when that judgment befalls you, you can't cry innocence because God's prophet, Malik Israel, told you what said the Lord. Pagan, in the same dictionary, Webster's, it says, number one definition, heathen, especially a follower of polytheistic religion, as in ancient Rome. That's no coincidence because ancient Rome encompasses Greece, and the Greeks are the ones who served Zeus. And they went on to serve, to continue to serve Zeus in their writings in the Bible. Maybe you didn't know that the New Testament was written by the Greeks and not the Hebrews. The Hebrews wrote in the, what is called the Old Testament, which I call the Original Testament. Either way, in the Original Testament, it was Hebrews. In the New Testament, or the Unoriginal Testament, it's the Greeks. The Greeks were known for being Gentile from the beginning. Remember, Gentiles are ones that do not acknowledge the God of the Bible. Gentile and Christian are the same thing. Christian and pagan and heathen are all the same things. Gentiles do not acknowledge the God of the Bible. You know how I know? Because you're always serving Jesus. Jesus is not the God of the Bible. I already showed you when Jesus had the opportunity to say that he was God, he refused to say so. He said that the Father was God. So you have to understand who God is. These false prophets have been lying to you. I'm telling you the truth. You believe what you want to. But now, whatever befalls you, your blood is not on my hands. I've come to the end of this particular podcast. I don't have much time left, so what I have to do is do a second podcast on the subject matter so I can finish all the things that I said I was going to show you. So be looking for that podcast coming up next week, okay? But for now, remember, if you have any questions, you can always call the number 623-986-4688 with all your questions and comments. Until the next time, peace. We want to encourage you to make suggestions on the topics you, the listening audience, want discussed on our podcast. Call 623-986-4688 to voice your suggestions, comments, or concerns.